Okay. I'm just going to sort of mention an experiment that I, I'm actually a quantum optician. I probably should come out and say that to begin with. I've just been doing some proportion stuff with Jim for the last four or four, five years. So I'm very, very new to this field. My actual field is quantum optics. I've worked with Peter Maloney, uh, uh, Willis Lamb, you know, the Nobel laureate guy. Um, and so my real background is, is basically quantum vacuum type stuff, individual photons and particles. That's what I really do for a living. So I want to tell you about something that you th I think you might find interesting. It may pertain to what Greg was talking about a little bit, uh, advanced waves, retarder waves. It's going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about Hornolica again, but just the advanced and retarder wave bit. But I want to mention a, a Gedanken experiment that was, I'm going to lose this board here, um, that was about 1995. Um, about that time, uh, Peter was in, uh, was in Europe, and he was visiting Zeilinger, and uh, he was asked the question by Zeilinger, uh, what happens if you were to put in a cavity, so here's a mirror, here's an atom which is excited, in it's, it's excited state like this, what happens if you put an atom in a cavity, so there's two mirrors, this thing two dimensional, and uh, if, if this thing were to decay, it would emit a photon, but the wavelength of the photon isn't, isn't, is too big, it won't fit inside the cavity. Okay? It kind of suppresses the spontaneous emission. So the atom would just sit there and it wouldn't emit. And literally, you, you, you could put an E-field detector in the cavity, you wouldn't detect any E-field. Okay? So it, you put it in a, a state that it can't, it can't emit. So far, so good? Now, the question, that, that's not the question. The question is, that's a well-known fact. Uh, the question is, what happens if you take away this, so you, you, you've, ta you, you've been building this cavity, of course, while, while there's no mirrors there, the, the, the atom can emit all it likes. Uh, you put the cavity in now, so you've got a cavity, and now it's stopped emitting. Now it can't emit anymore. Now, the question is, you take away this mirror, how, when, when do you detect a photon in the detector that you put right where the mirror was? Now let's say the atom and the detector are a distance r apart, like that. There's kind of three answers to this question. You might think, well, the atom's in a non-absorbing, a non-emitting state. Uh, the, the, the light would take a, dis, a dis time, a time rather, uh, r over c to get to the detector. So you're going to have to wait a time r over c at least before you, hear, you see a photon. The second argument is, well, this, this uh, atom was sitting here and it thought that there was a mirror there, but light has to go from the mirror to the atom. And then, it has to, so to, to indicate the signal has to go to the atom, now the atom knows there's no mirror, now it can emit. So maybe the time is, is, is 2r over c before you see a photon. And then the third option is uh, the time is actually zero and you see one immediately. Now, um, I think Peter had one idea, Zaling had another idea, and I had a third idea. <laughs> so, um, and it turned out, ta-da, zero time. So when you do the calculation quantum mechanically, a full QED calculation, you can show that basically what happens is, inside the cavity, before you've actually assembled the cavity, this thing is just in free space. So it can emit and it can make a nice standing wave inside the cavity, or whatever it's doing, some, some kind of standing wave. All right? But as soon as you put the mirror there, it can no longer emit. And then this wave, as you see, perfectly cancels out. So if you put a, e field, a detector in here, you don't detect anything. <coughs> as soon as you remove the mirror, it turns out that the energy that's in this wave, that standing wave that was there, gets detected immediately. But it's not coming from the atom. It's coming from the, the energy that was already in the cavity. So literally, all this back moving wave, all that energy suddenly, it's there, and it's detected. Now you might think, well, psh, I don't believe that. You have to believe it. There's been an experiment. So a few years later, a very well-known ex experimentalist by the name of Paul Kriat, he was a, a student of um, Ray Chow, uh, he actually did an experiment at Urban Champaign in Illinois, and he did exactly this experiment with very, very accurate detectors. And I think, I'm not sure if it was a pockel cell or some kind of switching for a polarization so we could switch it very, very fast. And so he detected uh, the photon pretty much immediately or within the time frame of, of the observation of, of his de 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 detection equipment. It certainly was nowhere near R over C and it was nowhere near 2R over C. So it was literally immediate. Okay, so we know that that works. So you can take away a mirror and suddenly, boom, you'll see something. Now, what's that got to do with any, anything like this? I'll tell you. Um, I can reproduce this using advanced and retarded waves. So it's as if you have advanced and retarded waves in here and as soon as something goes away, suddenly, like an acceleration, um, 
you see something, and you see something at the point of the acceleration. So it's like the, the mirror accelerated away. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Like possibly a dynamic Casimir effect? You see photons immediately. It's pretty much the same deal. You, you accelerate the mirror, and you suddenly see photons. It's as if the wave here can't react fast enough to completely superpose completely. It's as if the wave um, is, is um, is not overlapping, so you're actually seeing energy, you're seeing those photons materialize, and that's exactly what happens in the dynamic Casimir effect. Again, an effect which has been observed. Now, why is it then, if a charged particle is in outer space, and it suddenly starts moving, if, the, if you have these waves that are set up in space, between the particle and the distant matter, have got advanced and retarded waves, they set up a nice standing wave kind of thing, you can move the, wave, you can move the particle with linear velocity, and the waves will still keep up because they're moving at sea, right? And the particle's not moving at sea, it's moving less than sea. So the waves completely superpose until you accelerate that particle. As soon as you accelerate, the waves don't overlap anymore, and you're going to see a manifestation just like that sudden replacement of a mirror, you're going to see photons. Guess what that looks like? Unruh radiation, right? So I'm saying unruh radiation is like a cosmic version of the dynamic Casimir effect. Now, I haven't proved any of this. I'm just, this is just off the top of my head. It looks familiar. They look the same thing to me. I haven't proved it. I have to prove it. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there as, a, as an idea. Now, bear in mind also that uh, what you can do for uh, uh, wheeler Feynman theory and the QED, you can also do advanced wave retarder waves. You can do for gravitation. You can have the advanced wave, retarded waves. The Hoyle-Narlicka stuff reduces perfectly, exactly to Einstein's relativity. To me, they're equivalent. It's like different ways of looking at the same thing. It's like a different viewpoint, as far as I'm concerned. Just like um, you can use advanced retarded waves for quantum mechanics. Ab exactly the same thing. I can reproduce all the, all the quantum optics experiments, explain all the weird action at a distance, explain all the uh, entanglement. All that is easily explained using advanced waves. In fact, it's even more intuitive than using the Copenhagen interpretation. So the Copenhagen interpretation and what's called um, uh, the, the trend... Oh. Uh, transactional, thank you. Transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics by uh, John Kramer. They're absolutely identical. They give identical results. It's just that one talks about advanced and retarded waves and the other one doesn't. So I, I like the advanced and retarded wave picture because I think it's, it explains an awful lot. So let's just go to the uh, gravitational region here. So now I've got a mass which is moving linearly. I'm thinking all the waves are nicely superposed. Everything goes at sea, so it's going much faster than the particle until I accelerate that particle. And now again, my waves are not overlapping properly. It's just like the, the sudden replacement of the mirror. Uh, when, when you have the acceleration, possibly, again, I've I'm not, I'm not proved this, possibly, um, then if the waves don't overlap, you may get uh, whatever the signal carriers of the gravitational wave is. I'm going to say gravitons. Uh, Jim is shaking his head. He doesn't like to think of anything quantized. But in principle, whatever the, those, the particles are, gravitons, whatever, might materialize around the particle. And that could do something odd to the mass. It may, even the gravitational field around it could change a little bit just as it accelerates. As soon as it's a linear speed, you're back to where you were and all, all is good. So I'm just throwing it out there as a possibility that um, something interesting might happen. It might explain <coughs> dark energy, <coughs> possibly dark matter as being the, th the things that materialize because it happens where the acceleration is. You have to have acceleration. So if you think about the rotating galaxies, where's the dark matter? It's around the rotating galaxies. I'm just saying it's just a coincidence, possibly. I don't know. I haven't proved anything. I'm just throwing it out there. And now I'm done. I'm going to shut up. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Doesn't that sound like what you were saying about the gravity well and sort of the, the little boat kind of riding up yeah. on the wave? And yeah. I've got little gravitons appearing and doing yeah. something weird. Yeah. It's, very similar to what he was saying, actually. What's interesting is that the experiment you proposed is... That's a real experiment, that the dorm with a sudden yeah. replacement yeah. that has been done. That it's, it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like an atomic shock tube. Mm -hmm. Is essentially, you have, a, you, know, you have a tube with a diaphragm in it, you pressurize one side really high, and then you blow the diaphragm, and then you have this shock wave that goes down. And the shock wave is a you know, microscopic interface between two pressure mediums. Okay. And you, know, you see that same type, it seems like <coughs> they're right. anal, very analogous to that. Shell? Yeah, your plates and everything, that just looks exactly like an EM drive. Doesn't it? But if you turn around and you put, you put at one end, you keep the two plates there, and you put at one end uh, PCT and cause, cause, a, uh, cause an effect where it shifts really quick, all of, a sudden, all, of a sudden, all of a sudden now, you have shifted one portion of the, the drive out of phase. So that end opens up, and now 
<laughs> what you are seeing now is starting to happen. People are really change. only now starting to explain quantum mechanics when in accelerating systems. It's really only now starting to take off. 20 years ago, I tried to get an NSF grant. They weren't interested. They thought it was too new, too weird, they didn't want to know. But I think David Highland, we wanted to have him here to talk. But unfortunately, he couldn't make it. He got a grant for doing the DCE, the dynamic Casimir effect type stuff. So he was busy showing people around his lab right now. So he couldn't make it. But I'm, I'm done. I'm ready to pass this off to the next speaker, who I believe is um, Lance. Go for it. Um, the best way to clean this is with a wet cloth. Do you want me to do that real quick? Well, I'll do, I'll do this one and keep that up. Okay. 